This week, we welcome Michael Goldgoff, Vice President Data, Network, and App Security Product Marketing at Barracuda, to discuss the state of industrial security in 2022. In the leadership and communication section, how CISOs can prepare for new and unpredictable cyber threats, eight leadership and management principles from ex Navy SEAL, practice transparent leadership, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. It's time to rethink how we approach cybersecurity because the reality is modern cyber attackers are already past your initial defenses. ExtraHop helps your security team find and eradicate advanced threats before real damage is done. Protect your enterprise and customers with better defense. Learn more about how ExtraHop stops advanced threats at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. That's extra H-O-P. Cloud security compliance doesn't have to be complicated. Whether your business is migrating to the cloud or a seasoned cloud service provider, Bar Advisory can help you simplify security and compliance frameworks, including SOC, ISO, and HITRUST. As an extension of your team, Bar Specialists will put your people first and empower them with the knowledge and tools needed to stay secure and compliant at every stage of your business growth. Learn how Bar can help your company build trust with consumers and become cyber resilient at securityweekly.com forward slash Bar Advisory. That's B-A-R-R Advisory. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 269, recorded July 18th, 2022. I am your host, Matt Alderman, from Living Securities Headquarters in Austin, Texas. Now, why am I at Living Securities Headquarters? So those that missed my LinkedIn post update this weekend will realize that Friday was my last day at Cyber Risk Alliance, but I am still doing my podcast. And today is day one as Vice President of Product at Living Security. So I am here onboarding, but still doing the podcast live from our headquarters in Austin. Joining remotely are my co-hosts. First, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Welcome, Jason. Hey, hey Matt. It's good to be back. I was off last week on a little PTO. It was, uh, it was my anniversary, so we spent a little time together as adults with no kids, so it was nice. <laughs> nice. Did I surprise you with my announcement? And uh, when you got back, you're like, wait a minute. La- like, last week he was... Oh, now he's... <laughs> No, congratulations. Happy onboarding day to you, my friend. And hey, you want to know what? I just realized tomorrow, my Patriot rookies report to training camp. It's about that yeah, time again. It is. Time for football, boys. Also joining me from just up the road, a little northwest of downtown Austin, Texas, is my second co-host, Mr. Ben Carr. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Matt. Hey, congratulations on the uh, the new gig. Good to, good to be back with you. Last week, I was out in uh, Boise, Idaho, doing a little company event, a little sales kickoff, and some whitewater rafting. So, yeah, good good to be back. Nice. It's good to have you both back. Jason, I put an article in there just for you, buddy, because I, I know you like that leadership uh, article I you put in there. You know my style. <laughs> I do. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions often and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. This segment is sponsored by Barracuda. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Mike Golgoff is Vice President Barracuda, focused on the company's data protection, network, and application security products. Mike has broad technical and industry knowledge that spans information security, networking, and telecom. Michael, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thanks, Matt. It's good to be on the show. And congrats on your new job, too. Thank you. Yeah, time time to get back in the industry. I think, as a lot of listeners know, I've been doing the podcast almost four years when I went to Security Weekly. And, you know, I, I miss building stuff. I'm an engineer by trade. And so it was time for me to get back in the industry and and build product. We're doing some interesting things over here, which people will learn about soon enough. But good to have you on, Michael. This is a very interesting topic for me, in the state of industrial security. And my background quickly, you know, I started my first job 
uh, was in nuclear power. I spent seven and a half years in the nuclear power industry. Spent about six months in oil and gas. So I'm very familiar with some of these systems. Uh, we spent a lot of time when I was at Tenable uh, focused on aspects of operational technology and ICS systems. A lot has uh, evolved from a security perspective, but Michael, my guess is from actually applying those security principles, maybe we haven't made as much progress. Yeah, that's uh, definitely true, Matt. And um, and it's unfortunate because um, the threat environment just keeps getting worse and worse. And uh, of course, you know, uh, in, in today's uh, geopolitical environment, um, you know, everybody is concerned with these attacks on industrial infrastructure. Yeah, so let's start. You, you guys went out and did uh, a research study around this. There's some kind of high level kind of key facts that came out of the research. Why don't you start there? Like, give us a quick overview of the hypothesis and why you did the research. And then some of those top line um, kind of highlights from the from the results. Right. So what we wanted to do is to uh, do some more research around uh, industrial infrastructure specifically, industrial uh, IoT uh, operational technology security. So we went out to uh, roughly 800 um, decision makers in this industry and uh, asked them a bunch of questions. And uh, what we found out, uh, first of all, uh, is that 94% uh, of industrial organizations uh, actually experienced a security incident over the last 12 months. So that's very concerning because, you know, we're talking about specifically industrial organizations. So the, these are critical infrastructure, manufacturing, water supply, all kinds of things like that. And, uh, you know, not only did they experience uh, an incident, they had significant impact. On average, they were down for uh, two days. So this is definitely very concerning. So that's the first uh, the first thing that we found out. And the yeah, second thing is kind of uh, more of a good news story, and that is that uh, just about everybody is in the process of improving their industrial security. They've got uh, either a security project underway or they're in the process of planning one. So they definitely realize uh, that they need to do something about this and are um, are uh, in the, and, and are doing that. And of course, there are solutions available. So uh, we we got to, uh, you know, keep our hopes up that things will get better. What I think is interesting about the first result set, right, 94% of organizations have experienced an incident in the last 12 months. Now, we've covered some of them in the news on the different podcasts, even on this show, right? We know about Colonial Pipeline. We know about some of those incidents, the the one down uh, in Florida, the water treatment plant right, right around the Super Bowl time. 94% of 800 is like 700 or plus doing quick math, right? I mean, it's 750, yeah. 760 organization. Not all of those hit the news. So that means there's a lot of incidents happening that are not being publicized with an average downtime of two days. Now think about that for a second. Like how many millions of dollars does that equate to from a potential loss perspective just in the ones that you surveyed? Absolutely. Uh, the, these are these are very significant numbers. And, you know, when you think about being down for a day or two um, uh, and, you know, typically people think of IT organizations and you can kind of work around it. But, you know, if your manufacturing floor is, uh, is, is down, then you can't be making things like, you know, uh, a while back we had um, uh, the um, the incident with the iPhone manufacturing, right, that like everybody knew that affected everyone. So the, the, the cost could be very, very high. And again, these are some of the critical infrastructure industries, uh, energy, oil and gas, which are very hot topic right now. And we really don't want those people to be down. We, uh, we, we, we need the energy and uh, other, other things that they're producing. Yeah, especially down here in Texas, it's really hot. I need that air conditioning, and otherwise, I'm going to melt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've spent some time in, in the utility space, uh, in the ICS space, both you know, working for a government organization and supporting these organizations as as an IT services provider. Um, you know, we're going from systems that back in the day were isolated systems, not as complex. You couple that what's you know the statistics that you just put out along with the pressures that are coming down on these businesses now, 
they have pressures for supplier connectivity, partner connectivity, persistent access, on-demand connectivity, uh, the ability to scale on the fly with who has access to these systems. They have sensitive uptime requirements, not to mention, hey, let's bring in support for a multitude of different protocols that aren't your traditional IT or, or security wheelhouse, right? I mean, you're talking about DNP3, you're talking about the IEC protocols, Modbus, you know, so all of this complexity coming down uh, on these organizations, it's that much more important to be able to have strategies and controls in place. Absolutely, Jason. I totally agree. And, you know, uh, th these are some of the things we asked about and found out, like, as, as, as you mentioned, the IT and OT are coming together. And, uh, it, you know, we found out that only 42% uh, of the organizations ha have any kind of segmentation between their IT network and their OT network, which means that your salespeople or your accounting folks can be actually having, uh, you know, they're in the same network as the as the actual facility. So, um, you know, lots of things like that going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's scary, right? Because Jason, just like you, you know, at the plant, when I was working on nuclear power, those systems didn't touch anything else. They were completely isolated. It was all fiber. It was all deck net. It was, you know, VAC systems galore feeding the control room. But those connections and those have been, they, those doors have been open. And when only 42% have segmentation in place, that means 58% of these organizations, pretty much anybody has full access to to, to be on right. these networks that that's got to be a little scary if if you're running a, a plant or a manufacturing facility yeah no absolutely in fact it's uh, the, the the issue is that it's 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 very difficult to contain anything so once something gets on the network if you don't have segmentation in place very difficult to contain and you know you mentioned nuclear well at least in the nuclear industry there are government regulations that actually require all this air gapping between and Thank God that there are those regulations requiring air gapping between the, the you know the facility and uh, and and the rest of the network and there's security and all of that. In many of these other industries, uh, there are no regulations like that, and yet uh, it's still part part of critical infrastructure. So, yeah, yeah, concerning. Yeah, network segmentation was one of the big findings out of this report. Mm -hmm. The other one, which I want to talk about next, is remote access, because that's how the whole water treatment plant issue in Florida propagated. It was a remote access. Um, uh, I think it was just a, a, a plain username password that got compromised during account takeover or something that allowed them to get in. So let's talk about the remote access side of this, because that was another big finding out of this report. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, as you mentioned, and it's very, it's very frequent. Right? In fact, Colonial Pipeline was remote access issue as well. So, um, yeah, so, so what we found out is that um, it's kind of double whammy because you've got, you've got organizations that allow um, unrestricted network access to even external players. And at the same time, they don't even require um, multi-factor authentication. So we found out that in the oil and gas industry, for example, 47% are in that situation. They allow full network access, even for contractors, and they don't have the multi-factor authentication uh, required. So this is a very high-risk situation. It's just an example of what's going on out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, in those instances, as as you mature as an organization, you want to start looking at controlling on-demand access, right? So times of access, how long they have access for, really getting down to those details. A lot of the progressive organizations that 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 I speak to are looking at that level, right? They don't want just right. persistent access all day, every day. They want to control the times of access and who has access and and really bring down role-based access controls as well. Absolutely, and so in in and I think the we're in a place where the the good news is situations uh, the organizations do realize that, but it isn't necessarily straightforward, right? Because as, as you mentioned before, there are machines, there are different interfaces, or connectivity issues. How do you you know you you might have a a, a, a you know. PLCs, programmable, programmable logic controllers, controlling machines. How do you do MFA in this environment? It's not it's not simple. 
Right. Yeah, there's there's some new technologies out there that are trying to build these buffers um, between the IT networks and the OT networks, right? We've seen like IT to OT firewalls, for example, which we yep. do both some level of segmentation, but also remote access control. Right. And I think the scariest part is when you think about zero trust principles, right? Because it's all been about zero trust architectures. I mean, this is foundational. Limit you know, least privilege, limit access, multi-factor authentication. I mean, there, there's no zero trust principles in what you just described. It's basically full access, no MFA. So how would you ever put a zero trust network or, or any kind of zero trust principles in place at these plants without somehow abstracting out the kind of the dividing lines between the IT and the OT networks? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's complicated. In fact, we asked that specific question, do you have zero trust access? And only 1% have zero trust access of industrial organizations. So, uh, you know, uh, part of it could be, you know, education and knowing about it, but part of it is complexity in, in implementing most of the zero trust access vendors uh, just really have built solutions for uh, IT organizations, not uh, OT uh, type um, organizations. You know, how do you connect this thing to a windmill or or a manufacturing machine? Uh, it, it's um, it, it's a it's a complex uh, thing, but definitely there are technologies to do that today, and so that's 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 good. The organizations are, are realizing, and in fact, most of them do have security projects underway to improve the situation, which is which is great news. Yeah, for sure. Um, third bullet point from the report, lack of yeah. automation. Now, what do you mean by lack of automation? Because that term automation gets used in a lot of different contexts. So what is it yeah. about the industrial environment that lacks automation? Right. Well, yeah, that's a great question. And and in fact, there is lots, there's typically full automation in industrial environments or a lot of automation, but, but it's on the... Um, on on the sort of main business side, right? On the manufacturing side or whatever. We specifically asked about automation as it relates to security patches. How do you update your industrial machines and other things? You know, what is your process like of actually doing a, a security update? And are these security updates automated? And what we found out is that they're mostly not automated. And of course, when they're not automated, you may not be doing them frequently enough. You may not be uh, having a consistent process. And that's that's what we asked uh, about as it relates to automation. And it almost seems, Matt, that uh, some of the uh, patches and updates were uh, kind of like reactive as opposed to proactive. You wonder how many of these patches are being done after they get hit uh, so that they know they need to uh, update as opposed to on a regular scheduled basis. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about the basics around patching, right? Now, let, let's realize that patching some of these systems are not easy either, mm -hmm. right? Because we're talking right. about potentially non-IT-based systems. So are there patches that can be applied easily to SCADA or PLCs or uh, types of these? But a lot of these also have management consoles that are traditional IT-based systems that are controlling some of these controllers, even there, the lack of patching and automation around patching there seems to be, I think, an issue of why some of these um, automation um, areas are lacking, I would imagine. Right, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and as, it, as it relates to that, um, you know, we found out that um, it makes a big difference of who does the patch. If the organization starts to do it themselves, uh, only 40% uh, automation. If if they actually have a, a specialized service provider or device, device manufacturer do it, 75% automation. So, uh, you know, the, the, there are ways to do that and automate even that, in that environment. And those organizations that are more forward looking there are, are, are realizing that that's, that's the best way to do that. There's a couple other things in this report that I thought were interesting. Um, we're going to talk about budgets in a second, but there's there's a question in here about the stage your organization is at when it comes to implementing industrial security. And when you look at the 16 critical infrastructure domains, we did a research project last year with InfraGuard around 
critical infra infrastructure resiliency benchmark, right? And we kind of stack ranked all the industries. What I find interesting is healthcare is way, like 17% com have completed some IIoT or OT systems, right? That's really low to me for an environment that's been regulated since HIPAA. Like that one, it wasn't that low in our research, Michael. So I'm, I'm, you know, there's just some interesting data here when you look at it, like, why is healthcare so low? Maybe it was because of lack of budgets in the early days, but you would have expected finance, healthcare, energy, oil and gas, some of these really further along in their investments, but it doesn't look like that's the case. Yeah, no, uh, you're right. And, and uh, I, I, I wouldn't guess why specifically healthcare um, is behind, uh, but you know, I, I think um, some of the HIPAA things are against specific, uh, you know, in terms of uh, going after patient data and and, and things like that. Then not necessarily uh, access to the equipment in a hospital and things like that. So I I, I think that again, um, it just got to catch up there to make sure that that security is in place. There is some good news in here. Spending is going up. I think that's good news. So, And there's active projects going on in this space. What did the research say about where spending is going to go? And in kind of, you know, do we have any idea of the horizon? How long is this going to take to get some of these areas addressed? Yeah. So uh, it, 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 that is an interesting, um, interesting question. And so what I think what we found out is... Uh, that most of the organizations are either in a place where uh, they've implemented a project or more likely are in the process of implementing one. And so it, it's, it's taking them a while to implement a security project. And we've um, actually asked a bunch of questions about that. We found out that 93% of the organizations have had a failed project on sort of on their journey to uh, industrial security. And uh, these projects have failed for a number of reasons. We again asked why, and some of them were uh, just, it, it takes too long to implement, uh, the, the cost gets too high, uh, there's there's too much complexity. Uh, maybe uh, th there's no clear responsibility of who is implementing this project. So people kind of struggling to to get to get that done. But the other thing we found out, Matt, which is which is good news, is that for those organizations that have completed a security project, they have a very very um, clear. So, so, so uh, uh, the 75% of those organizations that have implemented a security project had no downtime. And remember, everybody has in the downtime in the security incident. So what, one of the things we found is the security projects do work. They work for organizations. It is just, you know, uh, it, it takes them a while to implement it and uh, just got to struggle through some of these growing issues and make sure that they don't, uh, go at it alone, and they have the right partner in place to uh, to 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 uh, implement a, the the right project. So, so Mike, to so that Mike. point, what, what are the some of the things? What are some of the trends that you <laughs> saw that made those projects successful? You know, you you said you had a group of 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 uh, the people that um, that that you looked at that responded. What, what was some of that criteria? What were the success criteria that they followed to make them have a better path? So um, we, you know, kind of dug in into a little more detail, and we uh, we asked about what are this, what were the specific uh, attacks, and we found out it's a combination of web application attacks, um, you know, uh, a actual, you know, things like uh, a malicious external hardware, removable media, DDoS attacks, and then we've asked them about what type of technology they've implemented, and so. Uh, those those that were successful implemented a balanced approach where they had kind of a layered security approach to this, and they they had protection against uh, most of these attack vectors. So you can't just protect against one thing. It turns out it because of the attackers will will look for any kind of open door or window. You do have to have a comprehensive project that that you uh, that that you uh, implement to be successful. Yeah, there's some interesting data in here, Jason, where it looks at things that have 
already been implemented and work pretty well, right? And so you have things like antivirus and intrusion protection, mm-hmm. but app, web application firewall segmentation, anomaly detection, advanced threat protection, network traffic encryption are are some of the buckets that I, it looks like show up in this report, Michael. Of these are these are things that it, when they're implemented, they seem to be working to help protect the environment. So I, I, you know th- there is some guidance and kind of roadmap in here um, for for listeners that you know are trying to get their arms around some of this. Yeah. And, and I would right. say some of that is going to be influence as well. I mean, you know, on, on BSW, we talk about, you know, having that strategy and that seat at the table. And unfortunately, in this segment of the industry, sometimes it's the way it's always been is kind of the go to. And, 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 you know, unfortunately, we're in a time where that doesn't work anymore. Right. And we, we, we need to mature and we need to progress. So, you know, I, I would think having having those strategic conversations all the way at the top and really educating leaders of those organizations to, to make the necessary changes is super important as well. Support from the top. Right. But again, we have some specific recommendations, right? And where to start from, you know, things like fix your remote access, right? Make sure you have multi-factor, some other protection on on remote access, you know, automate your security patches and automate that process, put in at least some rudimentary segmentation, Uh, separate your IT from your OT network, uh, maybe look into micro segmentation. So there are things that that people can do uh, to start their journey and you know realize benefits more quickly. But the, so to your point earlier, the data would indicate that if you actually do these things and you start to take you know control of the security issues that you have, that it works. Right? It's not as right. if the investment and spend gets input and there's no positive outcome, which you could understand why people wouldn't create that activity. Yeah. But my, my question really, uh, I, I don't know if this is rhetorical or I'm really looking for an answer, but if the data indicates that, why still the hesitancy, why the lack of effort to actually implement these controls when they are actually effective? That's that's where I find it very confusing that that we're not tracking to the data more. We're tracking to it's too hard. I, you know, I don't want to do it. I've got legacy reasons. Yeah. Well, we asked the- these questions again, you know, what we found out was the biggest the the the, the biggest reason was that uh, the project uh, like why did why did they fail? The project took too long, right? So what but what that's an indication is that maybe the organization wasn't committed enough to to actually see it to completion. Uh, the second thing was the the cost overruns, right? So it started to cost too much, and people again put it on hold or whatever whatever else happened. Right, so we know why uh, these things happen, and and you know people just have to stick it out and and see it to completion. Yeah, I mean the challenge probably for some of these executives, a little bit to Jason's point earlier, is getting the seat at the table, making the justifications, and then getting through these with executive commitment to get through these projects. Right, because it's really easy to get distracted right now. Interest rates are up, inflation's up. I got to cut spending. Well, I'm going to cut that security budget over there. I'm going to put this project on hold. But if the data says, no, 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 if we stay the course and we get through this, we'll be in a better position. It, it's it's really an executive communication and leadership discussion. I think at this point, for these organizations to be able to push through and finish some of these projects, because if they do, they'll be in better shape. Right. Right, absolutely. I think you're you're right on there. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Thanks very much for having me uh, on the show. Appreciate it. It was great. To learn more about Barracuda or how to improve your industrial security, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 